excited about what God has laid on my heart. And um, a, few, a couple of months ago, I, I mentioned to him, I said, there's a, there's a verse that God has laid on my heart that I would like to share if you would like me to do one of your messages during Christmas season. And so he, he agreed, he always does if I ask that, because I don't ask that, but a couple of times a year. And the, the verse that's on my heart and the, the title of my message today comes from the passage in Luke, and the title of my message today is Favored. And when Mary, we're going to read about when the angel came and told Mary that she was going to conceive and she was going to give birth to the Christ child, and that he told her that favor was hers. And so we're going to understand a little bit about what that meant at that season and, and how God put that favor on her life. The, we'll start in uh, Luke 1, verse 26. If you have a Bible or a device that you'd like to follow along with, I use a device because I can enlarge the print on the device. Anybody with me? Um, I like that large print these days. But um, this is, uh, I've got all of the scriptures here on the screen. If you'd like to follow along, it says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Galilee was a region there, and, this, and Nazareth was a city there. And it says, to a verse betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Let me tell you a little bit about what was going on at this time. Um, it says in the sixth month, it's referring to, in the previous verses, it tells about the angel coming and telling Mary's cousin Elizabeth that she was going to give birth to a child. She was old, she was past, they had said she couldn't have kids, it was too late for her. But the angel came and said, Yes, Elizabeth, you're going to give birth. You're going to have a child, and he's actually going to come ahead of the Messiah, and he's going, he's going to proclaim a way and declare uh, about Jesus. And so he comes to Mary. Mary was of the how of the um, was betrothed to Joseph. Now, what that meant was she was engaged to be married to Joseph. Now, an engagement in Jewish custom at that time was not as simple as a ring on your finger. It was a legal binding commitment. And you would be engaged for about a year before you actually got married. And so in order to break an engagement, to break betrothment, you actually had to get have a divorce and get a divorce. And so that was Mary's situation. Um, let me give you a little bit more background of what had been going on at this time. This was, we sang a song just a moment ago and in that song, it says, in the darkness, we were waiting without hope. Did you, did you wonder, what are they talking about? What, why are we singing? This was the situation at this time. It had been 400 years since God has spoke to his people through a prophet. There was written scrolls and scripture. They had Psalms and Proverbs, but people didn't have a device or a written Bible that they could carry around. You went to the synagogue and somebody read to you from those scrolls and you studied that way. But that was the situation here. It had been 400 years since there had been a prophet and somebody to speak for God as a mouthpiece to his people. During this 400 years, there had been some religious leaders that had risen up because that's what religion does. And these religious leaders had um, used the scriptures to make a lot of rules and a lot of laws and a lot of, of, of bondage that the Jewish people were in. And during this time also, the Romans had come in and taken over their country. Now, I don't know what you think about the state of our government, but I want you to know I still believe we live in this greatest nation on the face of the earth, amen? But the, whatever we see that we don't like, it did not even compare to what they were dealing with under the Roman government that they had to submit to. And so this was a time, as we sang just a moment ago, without hope, without light. But there was this girl named Mary who was engaged, and she probably got up that morning 
thinking about her wedding. How do I want to fix my hair, you know? Maybe she pulled out Pinterest to see what looks good with this scarf, you know? Uh, she was preparing for her life as she had it planned out. She was preparing to live life as others had also planned it for her and what she expected. And then what happens? An angel, Gabriel, angel means messenger, was sent from God to her. He says, he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Now, I don't know about you, but if an angel showed up here today, I think I would be too shocked to really even hear what type of greeting he gave me. But this was, you know, this makes you wonder, perhaps Mary had had visitations from angels before. Perhaps she had had a conversation before. Maybe this wasn't an isolated incident. But regardless, what we know about Mary was her heart was prepared to receive the word of God. Mary's parents, Jochum and Anna, Jochum was a scroll scholar. So he studied the word of God. He worked in the synagogue and he studied the word of God and understood what the word of God, what the promises were. What, and he taught his daughter, Mary, to love the word of God. You know, we had just a few months ago here at Cornerstone, we had baby dedication. And I see some of the faces out here of the parents that dedicated their baby. You know, it's not a Sunday morning baby show. And I've heard our pastor say before, we're not dedicating the children like we're dedicating the parents. Because the parents are making a public declaration, I'm going to raise my child to know the word of God. I'm gonna raise my child to serve God. I'm gonna raise my child in the house of God. Well, that was what had happened to Mary. Mary's parents had raised her to know God. Wednesday night, we had, um, after our first Wednesday service, there was a little boy named Riggins. He's two years old, and Pastor Ron and I were standing out there visiting with his parents, and Riggins had a little nativity set. It, was, it looked like a little felt envelope, and in it were little felt pieces of the, of the nativity. And as mom would pull them out, what is this, Riggins? That's the star. This is Joseph. This is Mary. You know, that doesn't happen by accident. Too many kids now know more details about the elf on the shelf than they do the baby that was in the manger. And I'm not criticizing elf on the shelf. I, I think it looks like a lot of fun. I'm not, I'm not criticizing and saying it's not okay. But what is the priority? We don't have to throw this away, but let's make sure that our kids are knowing what the word of God is. And so as we stood there and we listened to little Riggins at two years old be able to tell us about the nativity service, the, the nativity, and I just was so filled with thankfulness for that teacher that probably worked all day and then came to serve in that classroom. I was thankful for those parents who they're expecting that got around a two-year-old, they probably worked all day and they were at church on a Wednesday night. I'm thankful for parents who take the opportunity to invest in their children and to teach their children the word of God because we never know when God is going to call our, kid, our child to do something and we want them to be ready to hear the voice of God. We want them to be ready to respond. And so that was what Mary was like, well, what kind of greeting is this? And we're gonna talk a little bit about what it means to be favored. And I believe that's why Mary was like, what is this supposed to be all about? And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And so Mary, so the angel approached the area of Mary's life that she was probably dealing with, and that was fear. Because Mary understood that favor was for a purpose, not for a status. That the word favor meant to be chosen, to be set aside, to do a purpose. And so Mary is like, I'm favored, what am I favored to do? What is it that's going to be asked of me? Have you ever been fearful when somebody asks you to step out and do something? Have you ever been fearful 
when an opportunity presented itself that you felt like was bigger than your ability? Have you? I have. There have been times that fear will grip us and we'll think, there's no way I can do that. But, but the angel explained to her that she, her favor was with God, that this favor was to position her and to give her the ability to do what God had called her to do. We go on to see it, and he explains to her what's going on. He said, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the kingdom, over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. He goes on to say, he explains all that. And then Mary said, how will this be? Because I'm a virgin. You see, part of that betrothal period was having purity during that year that you were waiting to be married. And so Mary understood physically this is not possible. She didn't say this can't happen. She didn't tell the angel, okay, you just come and told me that God is going to do this, but he can't. Instead, she said, how? You know, perhaps there are times when God asks us to do something, and rather than we say, I can't, we say, God, how? How are you going to equip me to do what, I've call, what you've called me to do? And so the angel went on and explained to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing is impossible with God. The angel came to her and explained what she was concerned about. There's no ability to do this, and, God, and the angel explained to her, it's not impossible with God. You know, there's so many things in our life that are impossible in our own ability. There are so many things that God might call us to do that there is no way we can do it, but nothing is impossible with God. And Mary said, and this is my favorite verse of this, behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed her. That's my favorite verse because that's something that I want to see all of us be willing to do. To not tell God what can't happen, what we can't do, or what we aren't willing to do, but to say, God, just do in me what you want to do. God, I am yours. I am your servant. I want to make myself available to you. What would you have me do? And so I'm gonna break this down just a little bit more and we're gonna talk about this. It says, we're backing up to verse 30. And the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Luke was a doctor, so he thought he needed to explain to Mary where are you gonna conceive this baby? You know, it's gonna be in your womb. I don't know what other option there might have been, but Luke was, Luke was making sure that we understood that. But the, that the angel said to her, do not be afraid. You know, sometimes there are things that God might call us to do that are going to turn our life upside down that we may have plans, we may have goals, and God may come along and say, I want to do something completely different. This is what happened with Mary. Her life was being turned upside down, excuse me. And with that, I love that it goes on that Mary had the ability to say yes or not. but. What did she have to be afraid of? Well, let's understand a little bit about the Jewish custom. First of all, her parents could have ostracized her. A few years ago, our son served for a year in Afghanistan, and he did um, security detail at the hospital. And he called us one time, and he said there was a nurse 
that had been raped by the doctor. And he said, we won't see her again. And here's what you have to understand about her. And he had developed a relationship. He knew this woman. He said, what you have to understand is her life is over. Her family will throw her aside. She's lost her job. She's lost everything. And this doctor has lost nothing. And it was very upsetting to see, well, we were, that's the Middle East. And this was Middle East. And that's what could have happened to Mary. She could have had her parents cast her aside. She could have had Joseph cast her aside. She actually could have been taken out and stoned to death and killed. Her life was turned upside down when God gave her this opportunity to carry Jesus. So here's what we've got to understand is favor is for a purpose. You know, favor's not for our status. It's not so that we can look good. I've heard people say, I've got favor, that means I'm gonna have the best parking spot. I've got favor, that means my ticket's gonna be drawn in the raffle. Because I've got favor. You know what, that's not what we understand that favor, if that's, if that's our definition of favor, we need to get a life. We need to be willing to say, okay, let me buy a prize for the raffle for somebody else to get. How about if I park at the further end of the parking lot so that the front parking spaces are available for somebody who maybe isn't as physically capable of walking as I am? How about I step back and not look at favor for me, but look at favor for what is God wanting to do through me? I'll let you know a little thing that I've learned, and that is... Anytime I start living myself, my life, according to my capability and my ability and not his supernatural ability through me, I get weary. I stop having fun. I can start getting depressed. And I start having those thoughts of me, 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 me. But when we step aside from those thoughts One of our parts of our vision here at Cornerstone is taking Jesus to others. And when I step aside and I think it's not about me, it's about others. It's not about me. It's not about me being puffed up or me being elevated, but it's about what can I do to reach my community? What can I do to touch others? When you came in this morning, there's a card on your seat about, it's an invite card for our Christmas Eve service. You know, we started having Christmas Eve services here, I'm thinking it was probably about 17 or 18 years ago. And you know what? The reason we started having Christmas Eve service was not because we weren't busy enough in in December and we needed something else to do. That's not why we started having Christmas Eve service. We started having Christmas Eve service because there's a community that is saying, I know Christmas is supposed to be about Jesus, but I really can't find time, can't find opportunity to find him in Christmas. And so we started doing these, and our pastor's heart was that it's a time, and I've heard him say before, you can come in your apron. It's a time to stop what you're doing and step through the doors and take one hour We have communion, we have worship. There's even some things that are very amazingly entertaining because we have an awesome team that puts that together. But we have a very special one hour service so that we can stop. Because how would you feel if it was your birthday and everybody kept throwing a party and didn't invite you to be a part of it? But this is our opportunity to stop and say, okay, I have had what we like to create it here at Cornerstone a moment with God. And I wanna let you know that God moments don't only happen when we're in this auditorium. God moments happen in those classrooms. God moments happen on the golf carts. God moments happen standing in the lobby, introducing yourself to a new person that was standing there thinking, maybe I should turn and run because I don't know anybody and nobody's speaking to me. Those are God moments when you stop and and share the love of Jesus with someone right here in your own church. God moments happen when we take that card 
And we don't just leave it at the table. First of all, we take the card. We don't just leave the card in our seat, but we take the card with us. We don't just go to the restaurant and leave it with a $3 tip when we've had a $45 bill. Okay? We don't do that. If you're going to leave it with your tip, your tip better be 25% or better. Not that that's the standard, but if you're leaving a card to invite them to Jesus, you better be an example of the generosity of our God when you do that. Amen? And so we take that card. What if we take it and we don't just find a place to leave it for somebody to find, but we ask God, show me someone that I need to invite to Christmas Eve service. Show me someone that is searching for you and has no idea where to find you this Christmas. And when I give it to them, I'm not just going to say, hey, by the way, our church is having Christmas Eve service. But maybe I give it to them and I say, we're having three services on Christmas Eve. I'd love for you to come with me. Which service would you like to be at? Because I want to be there and sit with you. Or better yet, I'd like to pick you up. Or maybe I'll take you to lunch. Or maybe you come to our home and celebrate with our family. But perhaps we use that card to actually have a God moment when we invite someone to come and be a part and invite them to be with you because it's hard to walk through the doors alone. Perhaps this Christmas you're thinking, I'm alone. There's nobody that knows me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to not have anything to do. Maybe it's time for you to go find somebody and you create that moment with them so that they don't have that loneliness. God is calling us to step out of our comfort and to have favor for a purpose of making an impact in our community, in our family, in our place of employment. The other thing I want us to understand is that we don't have to fear obeying God. We don't have to fear because it's not about my ability, as I said, it's about his capability. And if I say, God, I can't do this because I am not equipped. God, I am not, I can't do this because I don't have that ability. God, I can't do that this because I don't have those resources. God, I can't do this because I don't have the time. How many eyes have I just said? Way too many. Because it's not about what I can do. I remember when, when Ron and I were getting ready to get married, and I went and I told my college roommate, and I said, I'm about to get married, and showed her my engagement ring, and she said, Carol, you can't marry a pastor. You can't sing or play the piano. And those were prerequisites in the 80s. She said, you can't do this. What, what do you think? How many times has there been something that God placed on your heart and somebody said, you can't? Now, you still won't ever hear me use the microphone to sing a song. I care too much about you guys. But 37 years of being a pastor's wife, God makes us capable of doing what he has called us to do. And we need to be willing to step out in faith, with confidence, boldly declaring, it ain't about me, it's about him. Amen? What does he want to do? Don't be afraid. Because if I'm afraid and if I say I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, isn't that pride? Because that's pretty much saying that my inability is bigger than my God. And it's not. We serve a big, big God. The next thing I want us to focus on is that nothing is impossible with God. That, and I had her capitalize the word with because that verse doesn't say nothing's impossible for God. Well, everybody knows that. But nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible when I'm willing to step out with God and trust him to work through my life. Nothing, that's the verse 37, nothing is impossible with God. I've got some names of some people on here that had situations in their life that seemed impossible. Seemed pretty impossible. These are all out of the Bible. The first one is Noah. Okay, what did Noah do? Noah built a boat in the desert. 
There wasn't even a river there. He didn't build a little boat that you could dig a pond and go out there and float on. He built a gigantic ark that would contain all the animals that would keep him and his family and all of the animals safe throughout this flood. People laughed at him. People told him, this is impossible. You can't do this. Why are you wasting your time? People ridiculed him. Has there ever been something that you felt like God called you to do? But because somebody said, no, you can't, you shrunk back and didn't do it. Maybe it was just the voices in your head that you spoke to yourself. Yeah, you can't. And you shrunk back and didn't do it. The next one is Moses. Moses is leading an entire nation out of Egypt. And he comes face to face with a river in front of him and an Egyptian army that could annihilate them behind him. And all he's got in his hand is a stick. He looked pretty ridiculous. This looked pretty impossible. Sarah Sarah was like almost 100 years old, and she conceived a baby. The Israelites, they went to conquer the city of Jericho, and what did they do? There were walls. Cities were fortified for protection. There were walls around Jericho, and all they had, they didn't have any um, weapons. All they had was a musical instrument, a shofar, a big trumpet-like thing. That's all they had. Esther. Esther went before the king when he had not called her. She had the, She knew when she stepped out to do that, that he could say, I didn't call you woman, off with your head. He had done that to another wife. So she knew that that was not only legally what could happen, but that was possibility of what could happen when she went before the king. David... David went to fight a giant with a slingshot. How about Caleb? Caleb was 85 years old, and he went and he said, I'll take that mountain. Do you know that I I don't find retirement in the Bible? If you were to sit in our car or in our house and listen to our conversation between pastor and I, and we have peers because we're the age that we have peers that are retiring, and when we talk about that, we sit back and think, what would we do? Why would we do that? Now, I can understand you can retire from a job. You can retire from a career. You can retire from that grind But when you have a call of God to do something on your life, you don't retire from that. Because we have to get up every morning and have purpose. We have have to have a purpose, that favor for a purpose, a reason of what God is doing in our life. And, And we have people in the church that have retired, and I see them take and step out and begin to make themselves more available at the church than ever before. We've got our Cornerstone toy box this week. And we have Rick and Kathy Houston will be here. Rick just had hip surgery, I think. They'll be here serving. They're retired, but they're like, I have more availability. This week, or in the past couple of weeks, calling the families to set up the appointments and make arrangements for this, Kathy made the phone calls. She didn't retire from a calling. She retired from her job and a career, but she's saying, okay, God, now I'm more available to you. Now what will you have me do? How can I serve you more? We are called to serve God every day of our life. Never give up, never stop. Look at Mary. Here she was a virgin and was going to be giving birth carrying our Savior. Peter, you heard Pastor Colt mention Peter stepping out on the water. That's an impossibility. I've never walked on water. The woman with the issue of blood, that she she could be ostracized and, and ridiculed, and people say, get back, get away from him. But she's like, if I can just touch Jesus. And she she pushed herself through the crowd. Paul and Silas were in chains in prison, and they were singing praises to God. You have this little boy and you have a multitude of people and it's time to eat and there's nobody's made arrangements and this little boy comes with a meal and he says, how about this, Jesus? Can you use this? This is what I've got in my hand. How many of you think that he probably had his friend when he said, I'm going to go see if Jesus wants my meal? His friend probably sat there and said, you are an idiot. Sit down. Shut up. You're going to embarrass us and you're going to embarrass everyone else. Has anyone ever told you that you would be an embarrassment to God? That is a lie of the enemy. That is a lie of the enemy. God 
God has equipped you to do everything that he has called you to do. He will empower you to do everything that he has called you to do. And then we have Jesus who is hanging on a cross, naked, being criticized, being mocked. <laughs> king of the Jews, what kind of king is this? Look at him. But I want to tell you today, Noah, his boat did float. Moses walked across on dry land. Not only did he and all the Israelite people walk across on dry land, but God used that same river and drowned Pharaoh and all his army. Sarah gave birth to Isaac. The Israelites marched around those walls of Jericho, and on the seventh day, when they shouted and blew their shofar, those mohals didn't just crumble and, and fall where they could crawl over and through. You know, they went flat that they could walk into that city and take that city? Esther, because of Esther's obedience to do what wasn't comfortable and what was really scary, because Esther did that, her entire nation was saved. David, he killed the giant. Caleb, he took the mountain. Mary gave birth to our Savior. Peter, he did walk on water. The woman with the issue of blood, she was healed. Paul and Cyrus had the chains break off of them and the prison doors open and they walked right out of that prison. The little boy's lunch did feed thousands of people and Jesus did rise up from the dead and declare that we are victorious in him in what he has done. So that's my challenge to you today. Are you willing to say like Mary said, behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Are you willing to say that? Are we willing to do what's not comfortable? Are we willing to serve on the dream team? Oh, that might mean I have to be there 15 minutes earlier on Sunday morning or on time on Sunday morning. That may be a little inconvenient for me. Do you know we have a worship team that gets here at 645 every Sunday morning? And you know what? They don't just show up at 645 and get handed their music notes of what they're going to be doing. They were, they're given those days and weeks in advance, and they rehearse. <laughs> you don't show up at 645 and just see your music and, and do what they do. They spend time during the week committing and rehearsing and preparing. You know what? We have youth leaders who work all day long on Wednesday. Some of them don't even go to home, and then they show up at Catalyst. We have JT and Reagan over here. They'll show up at Catalyst, and they'll stay there till everything's cleaned up at the end of the night. He'll stay there. He works all day. Then he shows up and serves. And you know what? He has to go back to work the next day because he loves, because he cares more about seeing teenagers' lives change than what's convenient for him. We have people that show up and drive the golf carts. We have people that show up and make your coffee. We have people that show up and make sure that the handles and the doors have been sanitized and that the church is clean. Our dream team shows up because they're not concerned about what's convenient for me or what do I want to do, but because they've been willing to say, God, I'm available. I'm available. What would you have me do? Ron and I are in ministry today because the 16, 17-year-old kids, when we first got saved, if they said to us at church, we need somebody to do this, we said, okay. Well, we need somebody to do this, Okay. I remember when I was in college and had, was working three part-time jobs and full-time student, and I remember my college leader saying, okay, we need somebody, we're going to do this round-the-clock prayer thing, and we need, need somebody to sign up for an hour. Okay. I remember showing up and praying for two and a half minutes and thought, what am I going to do for the next 58 minutes, you know? I, wasn't, I didn't have the ability. I was not a prayer warrior. I didn't know what to do. I remember them saying, okay, we're having a revival and we need to go out into our community and we need to invite. We have invites all the time. We need to invite people to come because when they come, they may have an encounter with Jesus. And when they come, they may be 
changed forever. They even told us, don't just go invite them to come. While you're there with them face to face, pray with them if they're ready to receive Jesus. Oh my gosh, that was so scary. But I said, okay, I'll sign up. We need somebody to go on a mission trip as a youth leader. Okay, I'll show up. You never know when you're willing to say, okay, I'll show up, how God is going to transform your life. You never know the opportunities that he is going to provide for you and open up divine connections in your life when you're willing to say, okay, I'll show up. I'll do it. I'll be there. I'll love. I'll share. I'll clean. I'll serve. In speaking of that, our our Cornerstone toy box that's happening this Thursday, we have an amazing number of toys out there. It's not too late to be a part of that. This is a beautiful, beautiful vision of our pastor that will do it in a very specific way, that all of those toys will be set out, and parents will come just a handful at a time, and they'll get to go through and they'll get to select not one, but two, and depending on the number, we're generous. If they, if they see a third one, they're like, I want that. And we're like, we got plenty. We say, okay. They'll get to select toys for their children. And then we'll go and there'll be a team of people that wrap those gifts. And then they'll go and they'll get to sit down with that person that was their host. And that host will have coffee and a cookie or hot chocolate and ask them, is there anything I can pray with you about? We're loving people. We have 168 children who will have Christmas. Well, then the parent gets to take that wrapped gift home, and it doesn't say Cornerstone anywhere. The parent gets to give that gift to their child, say, this is from us, because we want the parents to be the heroes at Cornerstone, not Corner, at Christmas, and not Cornerstone be the heroes. We want those kids to know our parents were able to do something for you. So we have an opportunity. If you want to sign up and be here, we still have some slots that we need people that will wrap gifts. We need people who will um, host the families. There are still opportunities. But be willing this year at Christmas to ask God, what would you have me do? Perhaps when you're standing in line to buy something for yourself and the person in front of you is a grandmother who's having to decide which things is she going to put back because she can't afford them. What if I chose to put my things back and buy her things for her? What if this Christmas we said like Mary, I'm a servant of the Lord. What would you have me do, Jesus? Because we have been favored and we're favored means we're chosen. Does it mean we are supposed to have the best of everything? But we are chosen for a purpose. And we are never more like Jesus than when we are giving and forgiving. And I want to ask you to stand at this time. And I'm going to pray. And then Pastor Colt and his team is going to come out. And they're going to lead us in a song, I Will Build My Life Upon Your Word. And I want to ask you, as we're singing this song, ask God, God, what am I supposed to be doing? What more am I supposed to be doing? What am I supposed to be eliminating? God, what would you speak to me? Because I'm going to put my trust in you today. Perhaps you're here today and you've not made him the Lord of your life. You know, I've known people that made him their savior 30 years ago, which means they just wanted fire insurance and wanted to go to heaven. But they never made him the Lord of their life. To be the Lord of your life means he's the boss of my heart. To be the Lord of my life means I no longer sit back and say, what about me? But I say, God, what about you? What would you have me do? Who would you have me reach? Where would you have me go? What would you have me say? And we're willing to do that. So if today you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, I encourage you to pray that. 
as we're singing this song, just say, Jesus, I accept the sacrifice that you made on the cross, and I invite you to be the Lord of my life today. And you'll be a brand new person because he'll come inside you and he'll change you. He'll change you. And you know what? It's good to be changed when we become more like him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today, we pray, God, that as your word was shared, Father, where my inability stops, Father, I pray for your Holy Spirit to minister and to impart the power of your word, the power of the calling that you have on our life, the calling that you have on us to be changed today. God, we invite you now, Father, to speak to us individually of what you would have us to do. And God, as we step out in obedience, we know you'll speak to us more and more in Jesus' name. Amen. If you make Jesus the Lord of your life today, when we dismiss, we have prayer partners in the back corner of the church, and they would love the opportunity to pray with you and to get um, what we call a salvation starter kit in your hand. Amen. Great job, Carol. Thank you. You can be seated for just four minutes, if you would, please, because I'm going to share something that's really exciting to us, and hopefully it'll be exciting to you as well. And uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing in, in the not-too-distant future, just down the road, is that we are going to launch a third Sunday morning service. Now, i got to tell you, we're pretty excited about that. And the reason we're doing that, here, here is why every church growth expert, every statistician, every pastor that has grown their church will tell you that when your church is 80% full, you are full. What happens if you don't make choices and do things to expand? Let me give you this example. There are certain fish that when you put them in an aquarium, they will only grow to the size of their environment. And if you don't make room for more people, you will stop the growth of your church. Well, God's been doing some great things in our church over the last year, and we want to make room for more people so that God can continue to do what it is that he's doing. So we're not just going to add a third service. We're going to launch a third service. And in the process of launching a third service, we're also going to relaunch our church. And the reason we want to do that is because I don't want Cornerstone to be Midwest City's best kept secret. I want everybody to know we got a good thing going on here. Amen. And uh, so we want to get the word out every aspect in every aspect in every way that we can. So we're going to be launching a third service as well as relaunching our church. Now, when we set aside to do this, we, we, like I said, we talked to our ministry leaders last Sunday night. We had about 200 of our dream team members in here that we did a big presentation of why we're doing that. And they were all on board and, and uh, we wanted to share it on Sunday morning of what we're doing as well. But when we made a decision to do this, we thought, you know, we've got to do this right. We've got to act like we know what we're doing. So we did a staff retreat, went about an hour away to St. Crispin's beautiful facility there that we rented and we, we stayed overnight there. And we as a staff began to try to figure out how do we successfully go to three services? How do we do this right? And we stayed up late into the night talking about all the ideas, all the things that we could do. And all, a lot of research has gone on. A lot, a lot of phone calls have been made, a lot of research on the Internet, a lot of talking to other pastors that have been where we are. And they've gone beyond that. So we've had just all this advice and all of this counsel, plus a very creative staff. So it's about 10 o'clock at night, if I remember right. And we're throwing all these ideas around. And all of a sudden... It's like all of us notice at the same time, hold on just a second. God has blessed our church. God has been adding to our church. And we love every person that has come through the doors of our church. What we didn't want to do was we didn't want to dismiss God and say, God, thank you very much, but we've got it from here. You've done your part. Now we'll just organize all this stuff. And we realize the reason that our church is growing and that people are coming is because of God. And so we just stopped right there and said, hold on just a moment, because no matter what we do, we cannot get in God's way. We've got to let God 
be God and let him do what he does. So make no mistake about it. We, we know who's large and in charge, amen. We know what God is doing. So we thought about that and everybody there just at the same moment said, you know what, that's a God thing. So what we're doing is, as we're launching this, in fact, for you um, that are here today, on your way out, we have a t-shirt for everyone. Stop by and get your t-shirt that just simply says, because of God. What a great opportunity to just tell people God is up to something. God is doing some incredible things. And we just wanted to create some energy in our church to let you know, hey, great job. Thank you for what you're doing. Because like I've said so many times, great churches aren't built on great preaching. Great churches are built on great reaching. And so as we kick off this whole effort to go forward, we're going to give you lots and lots of opportunities to invite people to church. We've got all types of events that are going on, and all of these events are evangelistic in nature. We are going to be outreaching. We're going to be reaching out into our community so much in the year 2023, opening the doors and giving you an opportunity to invite your friends in to some really great events, really great things that are going on. We're going to, we're going to make your job easy by saying, hey, man, you got to come check this out. There are some great things that are happening. So when you stop this morning on your way out, get a t-shirt. We've got bracelets there that says because of God. And all of this is as we relaunch our church and as we add the third service. Now we won't be adding the third service until March 26th. We knew that it's going to take some time to get all of our ducks in a row and everything lined out. That's two weeks before Easter. We'll have two weeks of a, of a, of a trial run, so to speak, making sure that we can handle the, uh, the, the, the lines. You know, the 80% rule that we were talking about, we're at 70% now in both our services. And uh, our parking lot upstairs, almost, almost every week, both services, uh, the, par- the upper parking lot is filled and we have people flowing down to our lower parking lot, 20 or 30 cars parked down there. And so all these things are happening. We realize we, we've got to get systems in place as God adds people. So here are going to be the new service times. Again, we're not just adding a service on. We're totally relaunching everything that we do. Trust me, we spend a lot of time in prayer and conversations and, and working through this. But the new service times beginning March 26th at the church are going to be early service, 830. I know, that's early. Uh, we then our 10 o'clock service, and we believe this will probably be our largest service. And then we have an 1145 service as well. Now, just to let you know that these numbers work, we, we had talked to, uh, I think, Choctaw Baptist Church just down the road. And I think they're running between 12 and 1500 people. And they do the same service times that, that we had come up with as well. So we know that this is a doable pattern. We know this is a, these are workable times because we always, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. We know several churches that are doing this and say, man, these times work great for us. So in just a few months, right, we're going to be kicking this off. There are natural growth seasons for every church. Uh, New Year's is a growth season. We know that we always get a bump in attendance at New Year's. That's just a few weeks away. And we know that Easter is also a natural growth season. We also get a huge bump at Easter. So we feel like we've got this in place just in time. But what we need from you is we need, as Carol said this morning, we need dream team members. And if there's ever a time to say, hey, I want to get plugged in and serve others, this this is a great opportunity. But we also need you to pray. We need buy-in. What we're asking from our, our, our ministry leaders and our dream team members, we're asking you, hey, can you just be all in? Can we just be enthusiastic about this? Can we just thank God that he's answering our prayers, that our church is growing, and let's just follow after God and do what God's calling us to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. So stand with me this morning. We're going to worship this course on the way out. Grab your shirt, get your bracelet. It's all because of God. Hey, guys, thanks for joining us for the service today. I really hope that it was a blessing to you because I know you guys are a blessing to us. If you'd like to follow us on YouTube, there's a link below that you can find that. Also, if you need prayer, you can text the number that's below and we'd be glad to pray for you and pray with you. If you wanna consider about joining us financially and contributing to what we're doing here, you can also find that link below as well. Look forward to seeing you next week. We love you guys.